once again, I want to welcome you out to the Wednesday night service. We call it Keeping It Simple, and we try to keep it simple as far as just keeping it about Jesus. So every lesson we teach, whether it's from the Old Testament, New Testament, wherever, it's going to be about Jesus. It's all about him. And it's about, you know, um, us just um, showing humility and, and bowing before him in our hearts, in our daily lives. And so I like to say, it's a, you know, it's big him, little us. And so uh, that's what, you know, keeping it simple is all about. And so again, welcome uh, to Calvary Queen Creek. We are going to get into a new study because we just completed uh, 2 Samuel last year. Um, and then we did some prophecies about, um, you know, the birth of Christ since Christmas is coming up. And so uh, for... The next six or so studies uh, will be in, you know, a series entitled All About Jesus, and it's um, pretty much uh, about the person and the works uh, about Christ, uh, because we covered some cults and some false beliefs, and those false beliefs about Jesus, we, so we did a couple of those last year. Uh, but I think it would be easier if we became acquainted with the Jesus of the scriptures. And then if we come across any false beliefs, any false doctrines about Jesus, it'll be easier to identify them because we're so acquainted with the Jesus of the Bible. And so we're going to go ahead and start with a time of prayer uh, before we start our new series and the study for tonight. So let's go before the Lord. Father, we thank you so much once again, for who you are, what you are to us. Thank you for this opportunity to break the bread of your word. I pray that you help us all to have open and receptive hearts. And there may be some things maybe we didn't know about Jesus before. Help us to be open to receiving the, the sound doctrine about Christ, even if it challenges our previous uh, beliefs or doctrines we may have had. It's all about... Um, Lord, us um, gain, gaining a better understanding and conforming to what you want us to be and what you want us to believe. And so you're the source of truth. And so that's what we want, Father. And so I pray for the gift of teaching that you help me to rightly divide your word of truth. And once again, Lord, I pray that you will be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So once again, you see the title of the series, All About Jesus. And so, once again, this is what we're going to be doing um, for the next six or so studies. And tonight, we do have a particular focus here. And so, in part one, we're going to focus on the deity of Jesus Christ, the fact that Jesus is God. And so, we're going to go over some scriptures, um, some truths that that are going to come from the Bible, and we're going to show that Jesus is God. And believe it or not, not everybody believes that, because to some people, uh, Jesus is just a good teacher. To some people, he's just a prophet. And to other people, he is just a man. And in fact, Hindus believe that Jesus is not God, but he's one of many incarnations of Vishnu, who was one of the gods in the Hindu pantheon or their group of gods. But then there's other people who say that Jesus is less important than Muhammad. So to, to, to the uh, person in Islam, to the Muslim, he, he is less than Muhammad. He is not even the greatest prophet. And there's some who believe that he's less important than Buddha. And then Jehovah Witnesses believe, and you heard this many times, they believe that Jesus is Michael the archangel in human form. Mormons say that Jesus is a spirit child of God and the brother of Lucifer. And to many people of this world, he, he is someone whose name can be used as part of a curse word. Or, or maybe to some people, he is the butt of some bad or terrible joke. You know, Netflix at one point had a movie entitled The First Temptation of Christ, 
where they portray Jesus as being gay. Now, I don't believe it's on there anymore, but the good news is that some people spoke out about it. And then there's this another television show, and I don't know if they're still running it. I hope not. There, there was a show called Black Jesus, television show in which Jesus uses profanity and smokes weed. The, the, the butt of people's jokes. And how about the Da Vinci Code, the, the book written by Dan Brown that was published in 2003? And then, of course, came out as a movie in 2006. You know, in the Da Vinci Code, it asserts that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene and had a daughter named Sarah with her. You know, so uh, these are just some of the things people have put out there about Jesus and actually believe about Jesus. And, and some people believe they, they're using reliable sources. And they think it's funny, but they won't think it's funny when they're standing before him on that great white throne. You see, obviously, many people have their own view of Jesus, but, but their view of Jesus, our view of Jesus will determine where we're going to spend eternity. It'll also determine our lifestyle, and it's also going to determine our treatment of Jesus. That, that's what our view of Jesus will do. And so it is my heart's desire to start this, this series in, in which we'll be getting into what we call Christology for, like I said, at least six studies. And Christology, by the way, is an area of theology. It is the study of Christ. And what Christology does is it, it looks at the person and the work of Jesus. Who is Jesus and what did he do? That, that's what we're going to look at as we study Christology and we entitled the series once again all about Jesus. You see, Jesus, the Jesus of the scriptures, he possesses two distinct natures. One nature is divine. The other nature is human. They're united in one person, Jesus Christ. Today we're going to focus on that divine nature of Jesus Christ. And here's the thing about Jesus being God, is that if he's God, there, there of course are several implications. One of those being that if Jesus is God, that means that whatever he said was true. It is true. Why? Because God does not lie. God does not make mistakes. Some people use the word error, and no, God does not err. So if Jesus is God, then he does not err. He does not make mistakes. And, and what is one thing that Jesus says? He says that he himself is the way the only way to salvation. He's the only way to the Father. He is the way, the truth, and the life. That means that if he's God, then what he said about anything in regard to life, anything in regard to eternity, anything that, that, that he speaks about himself is true. But then also, if Jesus is God, then that means that there is assurance of life after death. Not only that, if Jesus is God, that means that man has a moral obligation to worship and obey him. And that's maybe why, that's probably why people don't want to acknowledge who he is. Because they know that they will be obligated to worship him and obey him and to give up doing what they like to do. Those things that pleases their flesh it would mean that. They were wrong all along, and their pride just won't let them be wrong. Maybe that's why people make fun of Jesus. Maybe at least that's one reason, but we do know that there is an enemy who blinds the mind of those who are unbelievers. And so that's why when I pray for unbelievers, I pray for the spiritual blinders to be lifted. 
But the scriptures give us plenty of proof that Jesus is God. And one proof the scripture brings out is that he is called the Son of God. Jesus is called the Son of God. You see, the God of the Bible exists in three co-equal and co-eternal persons. That means Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are equal. That means that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are eternal, always existed. You have the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They're all three distinct persons. Each have the personality, but they share one divine nature. They share one divine essence. For example, they're all eternal, infinite, unlimited. You can say that about Jesus. You can say that about the Father. You can say that about the Holy Spirit. They're eternal, infinite, unlimited. And so three distinct persons, and they share one divine essence, existing as one divine being. The Son is not the Father. The Father is not the Son. The Father is not the Holy Spirit and vice versa. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. No, three distinct persons, yet one God, one divine essence. And so the divine nature, or some say the divine essence, is what they are. And so when we talk about the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we, we are talking about three distinct who's, the word who, but one what. You have three who's, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but, and then one what. Three in one. One God, one essence, and Christ is one person, as I mentioned earlier, one person in the Trinity, but he has two natures. We mentioned that he has a human and divine nature. See, the incarnated Christ, he himself is one who. He's one person, and he has two what's, two natures. And so when you study Christ, you have, to, you have to think about, okay, which, which nature is he operating from? Because there are certain scriptures that are going to trip you up about Christ if you don't remember that he has two natures, that these two natures are united in one person, but these natures are, they're, they're touching, they're united, but, the, but these natures are not mixed, forming the third nature. No, there's two natures, they're touching. And so the Divine nature remains intact, and the human nature also remains intact. They touch, and so he will forever be what we call the God-man, truly God, truly man. We call that fancy word the hypostatic union, those, those two natures touching or united but not confused. They're not mixed but one person, Jesus Christ. And tonight, remember, we're focusing on the divine nature. And the point that we're focusing on that, that shows proof that Jesus is God is the fact that he is the son of God. But before we got to that point, we had to address the fact that God is three in one. That's what the Trinity is about. And so when you talk about the word son, it, 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 talk, it, it denotes relationship. That means that there's relationship within the Godhead. There's relationship in the Trinity, son of God. And so when you think about the word of, it means of the order of. So when you see son of God, it means he is of the order of God. In other words, it's talking about his essence. It means that Jesus, being, when we say he's the son of God, that means he has the same nature as God. Whatever essence God the Father has, Jesus has that, which what? Makes him God. You know, it's like saying that I am of the human order. I'm of the human order. I have the same nature as other humans. And in the scriptures, you may read terms like 
or phrases like sons of the prophets doesn't mean that they're literal biological sons of the prophets. It means that they're of the order of or have the same nature of those prophets or the sons of disobedience. You read that in the New Testament. They have the same nature as those people who are in disobedience. Or you have the sons of the singers or the order of the singers. That's what it's talking about. And so when it says the son of God, it means he's the son of the order of God. The son who has, a, he has the same nature of, as God. And so he is equal to the father in nature. He's equal to the father in the kind of being he is, which means that the son and the father are both God. They're, they're equal in that. They're, they're equal in essence. They have the same characteristics. They have the same attributes. We'll get to that later. Jesus being the son of God, it means that he is God. And so to say that God is his father, is, it actually implies that he is deity. By saying God is my father, he's saying I'm God. Because if God is his father, then he's the son by implication. He's saying he's God in an indirect form. And people today struggle with that, but the Jews... During that time, they did not struggle with that. That's why they wanted to stone him. They understood Jesus' claim to be the son. They, they understood that claim to be equivalent to him saying that he was equal with God. In fact, that claim was so radical, they believed, of course, that he should be put to death. See, in John chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, just to show you an example, it says this. It says, for this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself what? Equal with God. They understood that. By saying that he's the son of God, that's, that means you're saying you have the same essence as God. You're saying that you are God. Therefore, you should be dead in the Jews' minds. And then in John chapter 10, verses 30 through 33, it says, it is Jesus speaking, I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, many good works I have shown you from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God. But people say Jesus never claimed to be God. They understood that, what he was saying, when he was saying that, hey, God is my father. And so, once again, this relationship is not talking about a biological sonship. This is a relational sonship. Jesus has always been the son from eternity. Remember, he's co-equal and co-eternal. And so it shows that, there's, that this is his function, that this is his position, that him being the son is his relationship. And it also shows the, the hierarchy within the Trinity, and so it shows all of these things, function, position, relationship, and hierarchy within the Trinity when it says that Jesus is the Son of God. And so the sonship of Jesus is what we call functional. It's a functional sonship, not biological. It's a description of an office. It describes submission. And so when you talk about the Trinity, the Godhead, it Many people put it this way. They say the Father could be the planner, the Son, the accomplisher, and the Holy Spirit, the applier. But it's one God. We don't serve three gods. It's one God. The scriptures are clear about that. But then there's another proof that the scriptures bring out that Jesus is God, and that is his preexistence and his eternality, the fact that he is eternal. And so his preexistence refers to to, to Jesus before the virgin birth. And then eternality speaks of his timelessness. He is timeless. 
And so in other words, the son existed before the world began. He continued to be the son in the Old and New Testaments. In fact, we do have a scripture here, Psalm 45, verse 6. It says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. But, but Pastor Durrell doesn't show anything. Well, tell you what, read Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, because that will tell you that this is the father speaking to the son. The father is telling the son, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Again, look at Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, and it'll tell you. And so this verse is an acknowledgement of the distinction of the gods in their plurality, plurality of persons. And so, in other words, it's, you see the distinct persons within the Trinity. The Father and Son, once again, are distinct. You see that here in this verse. In Proverbs uh, 30, verse 4, it says, He who has ascended into heaven, or who has ascended into heaven, or descended, Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Who has bound the waters in the garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And guess what? What is his son's name, if you know? The son, Jesus, he always existed. Again, speaking of the pre-existence of Christ. We have another scripture here, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Seen this around Christmas. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And so, Everlasting Father is the part I want to focus on because Everlasting Father means Father of Eternity. That means that He is the possessor of eternity. This is the Jesus. We serve. This is the Jesus of the Bible. Because they believed at that time, if you are the father of something, that means you are the possessor of it. So that's why I say that's why I say that everlasting father means that he possesses eternity. That's Jesus. John chapter 1, verse 1. Very familiar verse. It says, In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so that word was, that verb in the Greek is is in perfect tense. That that means that it's stressing continual existence in the past time. He always existed. He is eternal. And and so the fact that he was with God, that means There was a face-to-face relationship with God the Father. He was always there. As long as the Father and the Holy Spirit existed, that's how long the Son has been in existence from eternity. You know, then John 17, 5, Jesus says, And now, O my Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory of which I had with you before the world was. See that? So Jesus didn't just come into being in Bethlehem when he was born of the Virgin Mary. Again, he, he always existed. Talks about, once again, his preexistence and his eternality. Once again, proof that he is God. And in fact, Jesus has even made appearances in the Old Testament. You know, his his appearances in the Old Testament, once again, shows that he always existed. There is a name for these appearances. These appearances in which he manufactured a temporary body. And we saw angels do it. Sometimes angels, they would come in a human body. These manufacturers manufactured temporary bodies. But when Jesus did it, we we would call it a Christophany, these Old Testament appearances of him in the Old Testament. And and sometimes he would be called the angel of the Lord. And then if you look in Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 through 15, 
In the King James Version, he is called the captain of the hosts of the Lord. New King James Version, he's called the commander of the Lord's army. That, that's speaking of Jesus. This is what we call the Christophany. He, again, he manufactured a temporary body. He always existed. But then there is a third reason why I believe that Jesus is God. And so the same names, titles, descriptions, abilities that God the Father has are also attributed to Jesus. Uh, For example, Exodus 3.14 says this. It says, And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. You see, I am speaks of God's self sufficiency. I am means that God is self-existent. And it also speaks of his immediate presence. I am. He is the becoming one. That's who he is. That's how he, that's the name that he gave to Moses when Moses asked, hey, if I appear before these people, these children of Israel, and tell them that the God of their father sent me to you. Who, who shall I tell them sent me? This is what God said. Exodus 3.14. But that same name, I am, is the name that Jesus used in John chapter 8, verse 58. It says that Jesus said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was... I am. See, I am is present tense, meaning that Christ was once again continuously existing before Abraham's birth. Christ was continuously existing before Abraham's birth. It says, I am. And then there on the screen there, you see a chart. You see that Jesus and Jehovah, Yahweh, we don't know if that's the correct pronunciation. There was really no J sound in the um, ancient Hebrew when it was first written. Some think it's pronounced Yahweh, but um, the Old Testament Hebrew, you just see the tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H. And so that's, you know, God there on the, I guess, to my right. And then you see Jesus there. And then you see the same titles, the same names, descriptions, and abilities. Abilities are there. Like one of the abilities that you see there, for example, is that God the Father, God the Son, they both forgive sins. You see that they're both confess as Lord. Creator, I am, first and the last. You see that Old Testament, New Testament. Jesus applied, that's applied to Jesus in the New Testament and Old Testament, Isaiah 44, 6, applied to Yahweh. And so that's a chart there if you want to take a picture of it. But there is a, a fourth reason or proof there that, that Jesus is God is the fact that he receives worship. And the fact that he was worshiped it points to his deity, the fact that he is God. This is something that God does not take lightly. You know, people or even idol gods receiving worship. So let's go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 4. Exodus 21 through 4, it says, God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. And you can even keep reading. You shall 
not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. So here you see that, that God did not want his worship going to anything else, to anyone else. But then something interesting happens. Because when you read Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6, it says, But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, Jesus first in rank, he says to Jesus, let all the angels of God worship him. So wait a minute, Exodus 20, he didn't want his worship to go to anything else, anyone else, but, but here he's allowing it to go to the Son. Why is that? That's because Jesus is God. See that? Hebrews 1.6, let all the angels of God worship him. So for those who believe that Jesus is just an angel, this just blows that up. Hebrews 1, you know, provides proof that Jesus is greater than the angels. So no, he is not Michael the archangel or any angels. He is God. Not only that, but remember, Jesus receives worship. That's the point that we all, but But remember that the true angels of God, the ones who stuck with God, who didn't rebel with Satan, they do not receive worship. In fact, when John tries to do that in Revelation, the angel didn't allow him to do it. But Jesus received it. God never got mad at Jesus. In fact, every time he spoke about Jesus, he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus received worship. God the Father is okay with it. Why? Once again, because Jesus is God. So that's proof number four that Jesus is God. He received worship. And then proof number five, Jesus has the same attributes as God, as God the Father. Shouldn't say as the God. It should should have probably been as God the Father. You see, attributes are God's inherent qualities that God has revealed about himself. Attributes are things that are true about God. So whatever is true about God, those are his attributes. And only God reveals them. We don't just make them up. God reveals these attributes, these qualities about himself. And so what we're going to look at is his, we would would call these his non-moral attributes, his non-moral qualities. These are the attributes that God does not share with people. He does not share this even with us who are made in his image. But the moral attributes he'll share with us. For example, the Bible says, be you you holy because God is holy. And so God is willing to share his attribute of holiness with us. But that is a moral attribute. We're looking at his non-moral attributes. And so only God can have these. Only God can be unchanging. Only God can be omniscient. Only God can be omnipresent. Only God could be all-powerful. Jesus shared those qualities with Yahweh, with God the Father. And first of all, we're going to focus on his immutability. The fact that he is unchanging. And so you have a couple scriptures there at one time. You see in Malachi 3, 6, this is about the God of the Old Testament. This is the, the God, the Father. It says, for I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. And then in Hebrews 13, 8, this is clearly about Jesus. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so both the Father and the Son share immutability. They are unchanging. They're unchanging. God is unchanging in regard to his will. He's unchanging in regard to his purpose. And that's good news because he still has a purpose, for example, for Israel, and he has not changed from that purpose. He's going to return to the program, um, to Israel's program, to, to doing whatever he wants to do for and through that nation. He's going to return to them during the tribulation period, return to that program. But right now, I mentioned it before, we're, we're in the church age, and he does not change. In other words, he's immutable in regard to his divine nature. 
And that should bring all of us comfort that whatever we read about God, whatever we read about his thoughts toward us, whatever we read about his plans for us, God is not changing. He is faithful to his word. We, we don't have to worry about him just, just, just pulling the rug from beneath us. No, whatever he told us, whatever he promised us, he's not going to move from that. He is an unchanging God. And that should bring you great comfort. In fact, when it comes to the nation of Israel and how he's dealt with them and the fact that he's going to deal with them again, especially during the tribulation period when the the church has been taken up in the rapture, that should bring us once again great comfort because if he's going to be faithful to the nation of Israel, that means he's going to be faithful to the church to whom he has promised great things to in Christ Jesus. And so God is immutable. Jesus is immutable. Therefore, Jesus is what? Is who? He's God. But also, Jesus is omniscient, just to focus on that attribute. And here you see a few scriptures. And so, him being omniscient means that he he is all-knowing. He has infinite knowledge. He knows all things perfectly. He knows the past, present, and future simultaneously. He doesn't have to wait till things fall into place like we have to do. No, no, he sees everything all at once, past, present, and future. In other words, he even knows our, our, the possibilities of certain decisions that we didn't even make. See, he knows that if we would have made a certain decision, how things would have turned out because he is all-knowing and he cannot He cannot unlearn anything. He cannot unknow anything. In 1 John 3, verse 20, it says, For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our hearts. And I want you to underline this. And he knows all things. See, there God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. But look at what it says about Jesus. John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. So he knew who they were who really weren't going to commit to him, who really weren't serious. He, He already knew that. And he had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. See, Jesus, being fully God, fully man, truly God, truly man, however you want to phrase it, you can operate from both natures. And and here you can see him operating in that divine nature where he already knew what was in man. Jesus is omniscient. God is omniscient. Therefore, Jesus is God. But he is also omnipresent, like the Father is omnipresent. And omnipresence means that God is present in all his creation, but he's not limited by by it. In in other words, all of creation, the universe can't hold him, even though he created the universe, even though he's omnipresent in the universe. it, It still can't contain him. He's bigger than what he created. He chooses to be omnipresent. It's an act of his will. In Psalm 139, verses 7 and 8, it says, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend or go up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. And and if you look behind the word hell in Hebrew, it's talking about Sheol, which is the realm of the dead. Or it could also be translated as the grave, but it's Sheol. So notice there is talking about God's omnipresence. And then in New Testament, it also talks about the omnipresence of, of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 19 and 20, for example, it says, Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. So I underline, I am there in the midst of them. 
See, in his divine nature, he's not able to be omnipresent. Why? Because he's God. And in John 14, 23, it says, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. How's that possible if Jesus is an omnipresent? How can Jesus be omnipresent if he isn't God? But he is God. And so the indwelling of every believer demands that Christ be omnipresent, but, but also to hit on the fourth non-moral attribute that Jesus shares with the Father, that that fourth one is omni, omnipotent, omnipotent. That means that God is all-powerful. In Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, uh, we, we see a scripture in, in regard to God the Father. In regard to God, it says, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. Now we'll highlight Almighty God. Then in Matthew 28, verse 18, New Testament, speaking of Jesus, says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus is almighty, all powerful. And then when you I know people may focus on given to me. Remember, Jesus has two natures. So he, in other words, he has two what's, but it's one who. And so when you talk about Jesus and you're looking at scriptures like this, you have to ask, okay, which what are we talking about? Which nature are we talking about? So from his um, humanity, from his human nature, he's been given all authority. But in his divine nature, he has all authority and they never left. He's divine. He is God. All powerful. You know, one thing I want to share with you before we close for tonight is that there is a creed called, there's many creeds, by the way, but, but there's a creed called the Nicene Creed. And the Nicene Creed is the product of two councils. It's a product of Nicaea, which is uh, present-day Iznik, Turkey, in AD 325. And it's also a product of a, a council in Constantinople, now Istanbul, in AD 381. And so this council was summoned to get together to deal with the problem that arose in Alexandria in AD 318. See, at that time in AD 318... There was an elder named Arius, and he began to proclaim that Jesus was not God at all. He was only a celestial servant of the true Most High God, that he had a human nature and no divine nature. So the Jehovah Witnesses still stick to that heresy. Now, get mad all whoever wants, but that's what it is, it's heresy, um, I guess I'm trying to say it as lovingly as possible, but that's what it is. And so this elder named Arius, he, he put that out there. And so this Nicene Creed, it has settled the question uh, of how Christians can worship one God and also claim that this God is three persons. And it also added clarity about the deity of Jesus Christ and his relationship with the Father because... you. you this heresy came up. Now they have to come together. The church, the, you know, these leaders have to come together and deal with it. They couldn't ignore it. This stuff could spread like wild, uh, what you call it, wildfire. And so it, they had to be dealt with. And so, like I said, you had these this councils. And so in this council, of course, what came out of it, this Nicene Creed, in this creed, you see that this heresy of Ari Arianism was condemned. And remember, Arianism, you know, is talking about that it brings Jesus down, that, that he's not God. And so that was condemned. And then there's a side note I want to share with you because some people are going to say this. Yeah, but the, the Roman Emperor Constantine, he, you know, he, he, he made him put that in there. He, you know, he had this great influence in what this creed said in this Nicene Creed. 
And so I would say that, yes, the Roman Emperor Constantine, who was a recent convert to Christianity at that time, yes, he convened the Council of Nicaea. He helped them folks gather together. However, his role and his influence in the council was not as big as some would make it out to be. In fact, he did not declare that Jesus is God or decide on the books of the New Testament as some would have you to believe. And in fact, this Nicene Creed didn't really change anything that early Christians believed. It just pretty much confirmed what the early Christians believed anyway, because we've seen the scriptures already that the Bible was completed, you know, before the first century was over with. That the, all the scriptures were done, the Old Testament, New Testament was done before the first century was over with. And so this Nicene, you know, council didn't happen until the fourth century. And so once again, we see all these scriptures that teach that Jesus is God. And so once again, this creed just confirms what they believed anyway. But then get this, there, there are also some early writings by early believers in the second century, even the third century before the council that refer to Jesus as God. So they already knew that. They already believed that. For example, there are some early believers like Ignatius, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Hippolytus, etc. They already believed that. So you had the first century Christians. You had the, the scriptures there to complete it. Before uh, the end of the first century, you have these early believers, second, third century, who saw Jesus as God. But even non-Christians knew that Christians believed that Jesus was God. In fact, there was somebody named Pliny the Younger, who was the governor and persecutor of Christians in 112 AD. He mentioned that Christians were meeting and singing to Christ as to a God. So people could say all oh, they want, oh, Constantine this, or the Roman government. No, they, they don't, this, was, this creed just already confirmed. It just confirmed what Christians already knew and believed anyway, but they had to deal with this heresy that, that Arius brought up. And here's the beautiful thing. Here is a portion of the Nicene Creed. Just a portion of it. There's more to it, but I want to focus on this because we're talking about Jesus being God. Some of this creed says, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and, all, and of all things, visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds. And here is where they kicked Arianism, that false belief that Jesus is not God. This is where they kicked it to the curb. They said he, speaking of Jesus, they said he's God of God. He's light of light. He is very God of very God. You can't get any more God than Jesus. He is begotten, not made. Being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made. Praise God, they agreed with the scriptures and with the earlier the Christians who came before them already knew. And so what you see here and what you've seen earlier in this study, you see that this is the Jesus of reality. That yes, he is deity. That yes, he is God. You see that this is the Jesus of the scriptures. You see that this is the Jesus that we serve, that we're gathered here today to serve, that, that this is the Jesus that when we worship and, and we lift our hands, this is the Jesus we lift our hands to, that this is the Jesus that we sing to, that this is the God that we honor in our daily lives, that, that this is the Jesus that we focus on when, when we're out driving or when we're out in the store, when we're out in public and we're wondering, hey, is, would Jesus do this? What would Jesus do? This is the Jesus that we're talking about, this God, a very God, 
This is the Jesus that, that, that they shared here in this Nicene Creed that we saw in these scriptures and that we talked about tonight. This is the Jesus who was worthy of our praise. This is the Jesus who was worthy of our worship. And all I have to say to all of this is that people need to put some respect on his name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray as the worship team comes up. Father, we thank you. We thank you for who you are and what you are to us. We acknowledge that your name is above all names. And that there is no God. There's no God like you. There is no other Savior. There is no other name of the heaven by which any man can be saved. Hi, baby. <laughs> Lord, I pray your blessings upon your people. As we leave this place, but never from your presence. That you would equip us, Lord, to do your will. that you will be glorified. In Jesus' name. Amen. So the next study we're going to talk about is humanity. So we're just just getting started. So I can't be crying after every lesson. <laughs> so hopefully this is all, this is it. <laughs> but thank you so much for coming out. If you're able to stand, please do. And as always, we love you. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. <clears throat>